Angelo. Patrick's 21 now and he's got Asperger's syndrome. And Angelo is 18 and has autism and epilepsy. So I know that who's in the audience, can I just ask, is there any parents here of children with autism with a diagnosis of autism? Yes. Okay, now they're primary, secondary? Primary. <laughs> any, <laughs> any, okay. any adults here with autism? Uh, okay, and anybody who's a professional? I can see a couple of professionals out there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, I speak to an awful lot of parents um, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Anna Kennedy Online. And I've actually got about 18,000 people that follow what I'm doing. I get a lot of messages. Um, so um, I speak to a lot of parents, and um, the main problems that most parents are, are going through really are um, trying to get a diagnosis. And it can take quite a long time for some parents. I've known some parents where it's taken up to seven, eight years to try and get a diagnosis of autism. I've known adults sort of 52, 53 been diagnosed. The oldest person that's been diagnosed with autism is a person that's about, uh, I think he said he was 73. So, um, and he said he felt quite relieved because all of his life he felt like there was something. And now he's been given this diagnosis, he feels like this weight has been lifted off his shoulders. Also get a lot of... Uh, parents that once they think they've got the diagnosis, they think, great, I'm going to get all the support that I need. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case for a lot of the parents. They ha that's just the start of the ladder, really. And what I get from a lot of parents as well, I'm just going through a little bit of what parents say to me on Facebook, just to give you an idea of what they're talking about. And a lot of parents are isolated. And you think that services might, might be not so good in the areas that you live in, the United Kingdom. But it's the same for America, it's the same for Morocco, it's the same for Pakistan and India. I speak to people in um, mums that say because their children have autism, they are not allowed to go to school. So that's, you know, an awful position to be in. So parents are struggling to try and get a statement of special educational needs. It's a minefield. You need a degree to try and figure out what it's all about. Part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. What's all that about? Then um, once they get to transition, again, parents are having difficulty with that. And then once the children get to 18, 19, that's if they've managed to stay within mainstream school. Great, fantastic. But if they need a special school, then yet again, that's another battle for them. And if there is a special school within the area that they live in. You've got parents that once they get their children get to 18, 19, there's nothing. There's just nothing. There's one big black hole that... I'm not trying to give you doom and gloom here, but it's, I'm just talking about what parents are saying to me. And there's just nothing at all. So hence, my boys were diagnosed. Patrick was diagnosed when he was four years old. He was premature. He was only two pounds when he was born. And with both pregnancies, I had preeclampsia and toxemia. They said it's very rare to get it the second time, but I got it. Um, and Patrick was only two pounds when he was born, and he's now six foot one, and he's doing really, really well. Patrick was diagnosed at four years old, but we weren't told till he was seven, and we found out by accident. What happened was, um, because Patrick was having such difficulties because he was premature and he was going through things like he picked up things like whooping cough, septicemia, you name it, what was going on, he seemed to be picking it up. So we were having difficulties in trying to get Patrick to go to school. Kicking, screaming, trying to get over the steering wheel while I was driving. We had a couple of car accidents as well. And um, finally, after three years of battling with trying to get Patrick to school, he used to spend a lot of his time in the corridors. Um, he said that it was things like um, those eyes that were looking at him in, in the classroom. Then we discovered that it was the word classroom. It was the two O's. He said there were two eyes that were looking at him. And it was because of his anxieties. He also used to say that there was a mouth that would swallow him up when he went into the hall. And then I realised it was the doors, that that was the mouth that once he went in. Because he had sensory difficulties, he would be waiting for the children for the next time that they would clap because he couldn't cope with that. Or when they would next move their chairs, it was the scraping of the chair so he couldn't concentrate. So one particular day, when I was trying to get Patrick into school, um, he was very, very distressed. I had Angelo in the buggy and he used to wrap his legs around the buggy. And I used to hate all the looks of pity I used to get from the parents as I was trying to struggle to get him in. And I just couldn't get him out of the car. And when I did get him out of the car, there was a wall that is just opposite the, um, the gate of the school. And he just buried his head in the wall and he cried and cried and cried. So one of the parents ran to get the head teacher, Mrs. Doherty, who had 11 children, um, came up. She just said, what are we doing to this young man? So they decided to um, set up a review of us all together to find out what we could do to 
help Patrick. And in the meantime, we were going to see um, a psychotherapist as a family because it was having a real bad impact on our family life. Patrick was sleepwalking, he was soiling himself. He used to say there was an angry lady that come and visit him every day. Um, that was quite specific how she was. She had long white hair, she'd have a, a red dress and no shoes, and she'd come and sit on his bed. So um, after a while, he said that she'd moved out of his room and gone into my wardrobe. So I'd made sure my wardrobe's door was shut at night when I went to bed just in case she decided to come out. <laughs> So we were all sitting down and um, the psychotherapist couldn't attend the meeting. So what she did was she gave a report and it was handed out to everyone. And that was when I'd read. And previous to that, just a few months before that, Angelo had been diagnosed with autism. So we read the uh, report and it said in 1994, Patrick Kennedy was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. And then I couldn't think about the rest of the meeting. I just felt this like rush of blood go through from my, up to my head. And they actually said to me, why didn't you tell us, Mrs. Kennedy? And we said, well, we didn't know. We just found out now, same time as you have. So obviously I was quite distressed finding out about two children you know, that, I had, that had autism and Asperger's syndrome. You sort of go through that thing as, what have I done wrong? You know, is there anything I could have done differently? You're looking for somebody to blame, but there's nobody to blame. It's just, they're the same children as you've always had. It's just that they've got a label. So the local authority said to me, the ball was in my court. It was up to me to find a school for Patrick and Angela. I didn't know much about autism. I was hearing about the trial of impairments. I thought, what's the trial of impairments? All the, you know, there are these various different things that you hear about. No one actually sat down with me and said, this is what it is. I started looking at various different strategies. I was reading about all these various ones. There was Teach, there was PEX, there was the Higashi method, there was um, Lovas. And I thought, which one do I choose for my child that's going to benefit Patrick and Angelo, for when they get to adulthood. Very frustrating it was. So, um, in the end, the local authority gave us five hours home tuition per week for Patrick and Angelo, and we converted our garage into a classroom, and we went to visit lots of various different schools that were either mainstream schools that had units attached, which didn't have places anyway. We went to visit a couple of National Autistic Society schools that didn't have places, one that we did like was in Ealing, and they were actually teaching children in the corridor because they didn't have space within the um, school. And they said that if we didn't live in Ealing, there, was no, you know, there wasn't even any chance of us getting in on the waiting list. I was getting really, really frustrated because every book I was reading about was how important early intervention was. Now, the lady that was working with Patrick, she was working five hours a week, and she was working quite well with him. She, she, she did, actually did a good job, but five hours was not enough. The lady that was working with Angelo had never worked with a child with autism before, and on the third day she just sat on the carpet and she started crying and she didn't know what to do. So this obviously didn't inspire confidence. Um, I met another parent whose son had been diagnosed with some magnetic pragmatic language disorder. I don't know where they get all these sort of names from, but anyway... She was very, very um, isolated and um, hadn't met another parent that had a child with autism. And then we started meeting all these other parents. And we decided to set up a support group. And we did it in a church hall. And considering we were told, I was actually told by the local authority, that Patrick and Angelo were quite unique and that there were no other children in the borough that had a diagnosis of autism at the time. This was in 1997. So um, obviously that made me feel even more isolated. So what we did was we set up the support group and 275 families came out the woodwork. So where did all these families come from? So there was families in the same situation as myself as the children were at um, home or there was adults that were in a mental health unit. So all these stories started coming out and parents, even though they were struggling, it was good to share your story and to share strategies of what worked for you, what didn't work for you, what you'd read and it was a good way of coming together. So we heard about a school that was going to be knocked down and they were going to build 37 flats. So my husband and I decided to have a look at it. I went to have a look at it first and remember the gates were shut and I climbed over the fence and I had a look inside and basically it was a fantastic school but it was just empty and it had been empty for about two years and the sinks were smashed, the toilets were smashed um, and what had happened was the local authority had said to all the schools, come and get you what you want. We're going to knock it down, we're going to build 37 flats. So they stripped it completely bare. So we thought it would make a fantastic school for children with autism because lots of other parents were really struggling as well, the same as, as myself. So I went to the local authority and I always remember there was a lady there who used to be head of client services and her name was Mary Milne and she listened to what I had to say. And she said that she 
would take it to the Department for Education, to planning, to whoever it was that needed to listen to see if we were going to be able to get this school. So what they said was we had to do a feasibility study and um, we had to prove to them that you know, there was a need for a school like this. So my husband and myself, we, we put together a feasibility study. My husband had a degree in economics and management, so he put a business plan together. We went to lots of different banks, and the banks were saying, oh, very nice story, but shut the door on the way out type of thing. They weren't interested. We went to a bank that was Barclays Bank, and there was um, the manager there had actually been um, a teacher. So he really listened to what we had to say, and he said he could help us. He couldn't actually give us the money, but he could write a letter in a way that would say that the council would accept that we were going to be able to raise the money. So what happened was the council came, they looked at the building and they said we needed £627,000 worth of refurbishment and that was in 1998 and we had £3,000 in the bank. So we said, oh yes, we can do it. So to cut a long story short, they leased the school to us for 30 years and we had £3,000 in the bank. So uh, what I did was, what do we do now? So I went to the probation service and they said that they would be happy to come every weekend um, with all the people that had to do their service by cleaning, painting, doing gardening. Um, I put an article in the local gazette and then all these people started coming out the woodwork and a lot of them were parents themselves. So there was a Corgi gas registered granddad, there was a carpenter that was a dad. Um, I went to British Airways um, Authority and British Airways Airport and they had the, all these sort of schemes going on. And then I heard about this gentleman called David from the Link who lives in Basingstoke and basically what happens is when companies come to the end of the tax year, they need to get rid of furniture and they need to make sure that they don't lose their money in their budget. So I got lots of chairs, I got tables. We actually heard of a company called Foursquare. They had masses of brand new carpet towels and because they didn't like the colour of them, they wanted to get rid of them. So they said, if you can come and pick up all the carpet towels, you can have them all. So we had this battered old van and we drove from London to Basingstoke about five times. And we picked all the carpet towels up, we stuck them in the van as far as we could. And we actually, actually carpeted the whole of the hallway, uh, quite a few of the classrooms, so all for nothing. So it was fantastic. Eventually we opened the school in September 1999 and 19 children walked through the door. And my two children, our two children, were the last two to be funded. And they, that was two weeks before we were due to open. We thought they're not going to even fund them now after we've got the school. <laughs> but if it, they did, so that was fantastic. And it was a fantastic feeling for the kids walking through the door. The parents were crying. And it was like a real sort of family type atmosphere. Now, Hillington Manor School has gone from strength to strength. And we've actually now got three sites. And we've got all. Sorry, we've got the. Uh, we have got the capability of having 150 children. Sorry, Angelo only slept three hours last night. My son doesn't sleep very much at all, Angelo. So what happens is um, he sort of tends to go to bed at half 12, 1 o'clock, and he was up at half past 4 this morning. And this is like a regular occurrence. He just doesn't need a lot of sleep. So sometimes I get a bit brain dead. Um, so anyway, it's got the capability of 150 children. And we also opened a college because the gentleman that came with us, his son was in a psychiatric unit and his son had been misdiagnosed with schizophrenia and he didn't have schizophrenia and they pumped him full of drugs and basically um, he just was in an awful state in the mental health unit and his father was desperate to get him out there. So what we did was um, we said that once the school was settled we would open a college and a residential home for adults and we found a building that again, they were going to knock down in four or five years' time, but we thought, let's try it. We've never done it before, set up a, a residential home. So we did. We set up a residential home for eight adults, and we set up a college um, for adults with autism, a vocational college. We've also got now an outreach support service. What I'd like to do is um, show you, I was voted um, Daily Mail Inspirational Woman Award last year. And um, it was in the papers and I went to see Samantha Cameron and I spoke about my work and what I was doing for an hour. And she sent me a very nice letter saying she was blown away um, by what I'd done. And what they did was they put a little film together to show everybody um, Usley Grange, which is the new school, primary school that we've set up for Hillingdon Manor. So I'd just like to give you just a little flavour of, of what it is and the children there as well and how they've moved on. Yeah. Patrick was diagnosed when he was. That's Patrick, and that's Angela. 
man, but we weren't taught till he was seven years old. After all the anxieties and everything with Patrick, the school said they couldn't make Patrick's notes. <coughs> and I spoke to the local authority and they told me that while I was in my effect to try and find a suitable school for Patrick and Angela, their two children, and they were having a bit of home school. My mother in law shot my And that wasn't good enough. You can imagine how desperate and lonely they felt because there was nothing out there, nobody to help them. So they said they were going to start their own school. So all these other parents started coming out of the woodwork and they were very similar to myself. They were either at home with their children or their children were really struggling in mainstream school. So we decided to set up a support group, which we did. And it started off in my lounge at home and then it progressed that we went um, to a church hall. It started getting bigger and bigger and we grew to 275 families. We found out about a school that was disused and they were going to knock it down and build 37 flats. And what I did was I went in to have a look at the school, I spoke to the local authority, and I just said any chance of me having a the carpet sound they'll tell you about it. Stack it up. <laughs> Actually, that's my bedroom. He's not joking. Yes, we could do it, and they leased it to us for 30 years. My husband asked for voluntary redundancy, and we really struggled. We had no money coming in, we were just living off the voluntary redundancy that he had. And I remember we were having beans on toast and nine pence tins of beans and all sorts because we were really struggling. Anna is a very interesting parent because she's had two children of her own and she worked on getting a solution for them to have an education after a lot of heartbreak and difficulty. But she did not stop there. She took it to other parents and that's, I think, what makes her inspiration. That's all that. And we finally opened the school with 19 children walking through the door in September 1999 and my two children, the last two to be funded two weeks before we opened the school. It was a fantastic feeling. We had the inspector that came from Ofsted after a month that we opened, and he said that if he had a child with autism, he wouldn't hesitate and set up to the school. Anna is truly inspirational. Those are all the children. Look at the school, look at the man school, look, look at the environments that she's created for these autistic children. I mean, their future is so much brighter because she fought to get these buildings up and running. And you have to say these children are lucky. If she hadn't built this school, I don't know where my son would be now. I don't know where any of these children would be. It's really, really good. It's really helping me to come down the road. This is the college that we've set up. Since the Leader Manor School uh, has been set up, we've set up a college called West London Community College. And why I've set up the college is because Patrick and Angelo are coming into their teens and they're thinking, where are they going to go when they get to 19? And you cannot find anywhere for children, once they get to 18, 19, a specialist college for adults with autism. So we decided to set up our own. My daughter-in-law is the one who did this. She is ceaseless in her endeavour to spread the word about autism. She talks to people in India, Pakistan, tries to help them, sends them information, and she never, never stops. <laughs> We just actually got registration this week, so we're ecstatic. That's so we're ready to start up another school. Baston House School. Baston I've got some prospectuses if you want to have a look. I use whatever opportunity I can to raise awareness about autism. And obviously, this is a fantastic opportunity to raise awareness about autism. And the children and adults deserve quality of education and care. I don't stop with Like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we're actually having a conference as well, so I don't know if you're interested, on May the 21st at Baston House School. Um, so um, we've got a couple of speakers there. My husband's going to be talking about di discrimination in schools. Um, we've got <laughs> Professor um, Liz Pellicano, <coughs> who's going to be talking about sensory issues. We've got the principal. It's actually in your magazine, that's why I've given you a copy. So there's all the information on there. So if you log on to Baston House School, you can download the PDF format. Form. And um, we've also got a creche, but we've already got a creche for about 10 to 15 children. So if you want to bring your children, you need to book early. I'm also quite honoured to say that Medic Alert, I don't know if you know about Medic Alert, that um, they're actually launching the, an autism band. So if, say, that, for example, they've got things like the diabetes or the heart problems, 
there's nothing for autism. So uh, they're actually, um, what we did was we did a competition. So children with autism and adults with autism actually put designs together for this band. So two children who were siblings actually won the competition and then an adult with autism won the competition as well. So this band is going to be launched um, on March the 19th on around World Autism Day. And they've actually named it after me, so I'm quite honoured about that. So if you think that your child might like a band, if you go... Um, onto the uh, Medical Alert website, there's lots of information on there. And if you're interested in coming to the launch, just let me know and I can slip you in. There'll be a few celebrities there as well and um, be nibbles and what have you. So you're very welcome, but you just need to let me know because we're doing numbers at the moment. I've also written a book as well called Not Stupid. I'm thinking of another book to do as well at the moment. And um, I spoke on Radio 4 and um, the switchboard got inundated with people who were in or parents and wanted to speak to me. And I just wanted to share with you just a little bit from the book um, that what Patrick says and how, how autism affects him and how it was for him at school. And what he's saying is that I felt different from other kids and I remember kicking off because I didn't want to go to school. I was having tantrums every day but I didn't know I had Asperger's syndrome or what it was. I remember kicking and screaming on the way to school each morning and some woman trying to make me feel better by showing me her earrings. But that didn't work. I made up excuses not to go to school, sometimes telling my mum that there were weird things that she didn't know about in the school, such as the ground would open up there and I would fall through it. I couldn't understand what my teacher was telling the class. When she told us all to do something like stand up, all the others would stand, but I never realised she wanted me to stand as well because she hadn't said my name. I remember drawing pictures of me blowing the school up and I drew myself holding a detonator with my eyes sticking out and smoke coming out of my ears because I was so angry. I would grab my hair and tug at it. I was trying to pull it out because of my frustration. I didn't feel as though I fitted in. I was kicking against my frustration and I used to think I was really stupid. I would make furious audio tips saying how much I hated the school. I really like Eminem songs. Sometimes when I listen to the lyrics and I hear him expressing his anger as he refers to his past, it reminds me of my own past and my audio tapes. It reminds me of the times when this or that was happening to me and I was getting so upset I was trying to tear my hair out. Eminem's lyrics remind me of that feeling. When my mum took me out of St Mary's school, I was really happy. Wow, I thought, this is freedom. I don't have to go back and I can do whatever I want at home. <laughs> I would watch cartoons or Jurassic Park or play the computer. One day, when actor Ross Kemp came to the school, he played, gra this is when we he actually got to Hillingdon Manor School and he started off with Hillingdon Manor. So he had a fascination with Ross Kemp and he wanted to be like him and he wanted to change his name to Ross Kemp. <laughs> he used to wear a black jacket and he's very good at mimicking him. He's got very good at impersonations. And what he's saying was that one day, actor Ross Kemp came to the school, he played Grant Mitchell and EastEnders and I was very excited because I watched it on TV. I was interested in the program and I was a fan. I looked up at the internet for the clips of the program and I really liked Ross's hard man image. It was very impressive. I have a thing about looking like a bad boy. I like that image. I've been influenced by Eminem's lyrics. In Eminem's image is great, the way he poses. I like that. He, saw, he likes to look at himself in the mirror and tries to imitate the exact pose of the photographs that he's got. That's just a little bit, but there's lots of tips and information um, and my husband wrote the chapter as well, and also there's a chapter there about Angelo, but there's also the more in depth of how we struggled and all the rest of it. So if you're interested, I've got a book there, there, five pounds. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my husband, he's just going to talk.